By imploding a sphere and putting the north pole, which is rotating anti-clockwise, against the south pole, which is rotating clockwise, you create a monopolar point on the equatorial plane. Segmenting the imploded sphere into eight planes creates 16 peripheral points, which when viewed in cross-section reveal the infinity symbol. In order to calculate the resonant frequency of any shape, you must first calculate the sum of its internal angles. To calculate the resonant frequency of an imploded sphere, we must produce the sum of the internal angles contained within all eight planes. The eight planes contain two circles, 360 degrees plus 360 degrees. These are connected by intersecting angles of 90 degrees and 90 degrees. When multiplied by the eight planes, we arrive at 7,200 degrees. All physical shapes vibrate at the sum of their internal angles, which are determined by the base angle of 22.5 degrees and its octaves. The angle between the eight planes and the zero-point equatorial center also determines the location of the knob and nodes on the Fibonacci phi curve on the pi surface. This connects and defines the placement of all the elements. We start with a 100 pi surface area imploded sphere, divided into eight planes creating 16 points on the circumference 22.5 degrees apart. The Sanskrit Fibonacci curve on the 100 pi surface connects the eight planes. Each intersection of the eight planes in the Sanskrit Fibonacci curve defines the elemental points. These elemental points are knobs and nodes that can be defined by a triangle formed from the point of the intersection between the 100 pi surface and the Sanskrit Fibonacci curve on one of the eight planes. This triangle extends from the node down to the torus equatorial plane and then at 90 degrees to the central zero point. The zero center is the collision point of the north and south poles opposite spirals. This cancels out the spin and therefore the AC frequency replacing it with a DC singularity zero point. This 3-4-5 triangle displays the ratios of zero matter to light and light to matter. From the area of the triangle defined by this right triangle with the ratios of 3 to 4 to 5, we are able to calculate the resonant frequency of the element. This is done by dividing the ATV by time. The area time volume, or ATV, is the product of the ratios between the 3, 4, 5 triangle. This allows us to visualize a proportional concept and is equivalent to a parable. It is not the exact truth, but it is the story that enables us to understand the underlying principle of the familial and group relationships between zero matter, light, and matter. The model of the elements describes the parable of family relationships that exist between zero matter, light, matter, sound, crystal form, positive and negative charge, paramagnetic disposition, and form. The ATV represents the resonance of the elemental point, its charge density, and therefore its gravity. Gravity is the inverse relationship of an osmotic effect, which is created by a lower charge density element, defined by alternating current, being attracted towards the higher charge density of a singularity zero point, representing direct current. The ATV illustrates the elemental charge density by representing the area that the fixed charge occupies. The elemental resonance is equivalent to and defined by the melting point of the element, which is defined by the ATV triangle area. When the resonance is divided by time, represented by 24 hours, 60 minutes, 60 seconds, and normalized with the speed of light using a factor of 7.5, this produces the rectified base resonant frequency. This is important because once you know the resonant frequency of an element, you have the metric with which to manipulate matter, as demonstrated by the figures of Chaldi. When all the elemental nodes are plotted according to their valences, the elements correctly align to their base frequencies. These base frequencies, which are also defined by sound and color, are indicated for each of the eight planes of the model. The eight planes also indicate the monad, dyad, triad, and tetrad crystal forms of the elements. The underlying ground plane on which the torus is placed accurately defines their positive and negative elemental charge. This ground plane also demonstrates the paramagnetic and diamagnetic character of the elements. The disposition of the sorted elements once correctly placed across the torus model, according to their octave progression, take on their unique planes of reference. The noble gases which are classified as inert occur on the same plane. Hydrogen is also a gas and occurs at the zero point of that plane, which is the point of greatest charge density. Hydrogen, therefore, has the greatest charge density of any element. The octave model defines the relationship between the frequency and crystal form in order to enable the reconciliation between zero matter, time, light, and matter. 
It is a proportional representation of the infolding and warping of time and space. As the model of the elements defines the location upon the pi surface that each element will report to, the octave model allows for the visualization of the charge density, crystal form and resonance of each element. This model is capable of defining and quantifying the eight-shell internal structure of each atom. The octave model, which represents one-eighth of a sphere, visualizes the musical octaves, the relationship to their crystal forms and their 22.5 degree primary, 45 degree secondary and 90 degree tertiary spatial dimensional relationships. The octave model, when folded, demonstrates the alteration of the area time volume as it metamorphoses from the high charge density fifth dimension to the low charge density first dimensional base. The new shape derived from the base 22.5 degree angle is the translate representing the relationship between direct current, which is zero matter, and alternating current, which is matter. Rectifying the zero matter, which operates on a base of 12, and matter, which operates on a base of 16, is essential to any torus spiral collision based fusion device capable of operating at room temperature or above. This principle is demonstrated by the operation of our plasmoid thunderstorm generator. In order to achieve this rectification, you must first divide the one-dimensional zero-matter circle into 16 points, spaced 22.5 degrees apart, to create the two-dimensional zero-matter circle. This represents the transition from the infinite zero-matter circle to the finite matter square. When you join the 16 points on the circumference of the circle to their equal and opposite mirror points, you create two large squares, four small squares, two large rectangles, and eight small rectangles. This is a total of 16 cuboids generated from a 16-segment sphere. This represents the proportional translation between zero matter and matter. From this, one can calculate both the sphere and the volumes of the cuboids within the sphere. The plasmoid thunderstorm generator was conceived as a demonstrable proof of the ability to create charge and discharge plasmoids based on the model of the elements and the octave dimensional model. The major components of this system are a frequency imprinting device, which acts through ionization to precondition the frequency of the air. This airstream is drawn into a pulsed vacuum through a body of water, which promotes the creation of plasmoids through the collapse of cavitation bubbles. The pre-ionized air amplifies the atomic effect, as it is resonant with the frequency generated by the zero point of a collapsing cavitation bubble. These plasmoids are then drawn into the center of the thunderstorm machine, which counteropposes hot dry exhaust gas from an internal combustion engine against moist cold air induced by a vacuum created by the same motor. This creates free electrons, which are then captured by the plasmoids. These electrons are stored by the structuring of the plasmoid, which has the capacity not only to store the electrons, but also to share them with the plasmoid swarm, so as the swarm can maintain a base resonant frequency. This is an effect governed by the fact that the plasmoids actually increase physically in size, directly altering their individual resonant frequency. The plasmoid group's homostasis demands that the frequency remains the same for an individual as it is for the group. Therefore, the individuals must share the electrons equally. Eight thermocouples were attached to the key points on the plasmoid thunderstorm generator to quantify the anomaly between the heat energy received from the exhaust and the heat generated by the thunderstorm device. The heat of the thunderstorm generator exceeds the heat of the input exhaust, proving an anomalous above unity condition.
The underlying principle of Malcolm Bendel's unified field theory is that all elements are plasmoids and that all those elements are directly controlled by charge density, therefore making charge density the only relevant characteristic when considering zero matter, time, light and matter. The implosive vortex waveguide is inspired by the molten sea Vajra based on Malcolm Bendel's scientific observations drawn from his Bendel torus. This led to his unified field theory, which is clearly illustrated by his model of the elements and his octave dimensional model. The Bendel turbine has direct applications to all current technologies, but especially to the jet turbine and space propulsion industries. The Bendel turbine manipulates the movement of air using a structured waveguide to create an implosive vortex. This vortex, once established by the waveguide, becomes self-structuring, self-organizing and self-perpetuating around a pole emanating from the zero point of the model. This effect induces a vacuum, which is the defining operating parameter of the turbine. The airflow, which creates a clockwise imploding spiral vortex, centralizes and compresses the oxygen and fuel, which is then combusted to create a fire tornado, producing internal heat and an external vacuum. A conventional jet turbine directs the heat generated onto the blades, which in turn creates differential expansion. In contrast, the Bendel turbine directs the heat away from the blades, whilst the incoming air cools the system, creating a boundary layer that insulates the blades against the radiant high temperature emitted from the compressed fire tornado vortex core. This is equal to the effects demonstrated by the plasmoid thunderstorm generator. A conventional jet turbine blade has a high pressure boundary layer that generates friction and therefore heat, whereas the Bendel turbine fire tornado creates a central vacuum which expands out beyond the turbine blades and has the effect of causing the air in front of the Bendel turbine to be sucked into the central vacuum. The vacuum creates a minimal boundary layer effect, reducing friction and cools the turbine. The differential expansion doesn't matter on our blades because there is no inertial stress. The Bendel turbine, having no axle, turbine blades fixed to a shaft, bearings or moving parts, does not generate inertia and therefore does not subject the turbine blades to the destructive forces of heat and metal fatigue. In a conventional jet turbine, when subjected to both heat and pressure, the differential expansion inevitably leads to a deformation of the blades. This is due to the non-homogeneous casting and forming of jet turbine blades, combined with the weight differential between the boron, magnesium and aluminium alloy components, or composite materials where used. This differential deformation will result in an unavoidable imbalance manifesting as a vibration of the turbine, especially when amplified at peak load. In contrast, the Bendel turbine blades are stationary and operate as static mixes of fuel and air, structured and directed by a waveguide of intelligent design. This means that the weight of the Bendel turbine is an order of magnitude less than that of a conventional turbine design. Another major feature is that the engine moves into a vacuum instead of pushing into a body of air. When we apply plasma in quadrature to the zero point of our fire tornado, it combusts any remaining material and adds effective electron thrust, creating an afterburner effect. Our electron scavenging plasmoid drive creates holographic zero matter, which is to say it generates all frequencies, therefore it emits direct current, which is no frequency. This represents the 360 degree, zero degree paradigm. This drive is based on the framework of our model of the elements and is achieved by placing three part copper coils at the elemental nodal positions and passing neodymium magnets through each coil's aperture in sequential progression. The resulting pulses release electrons, which are harvested using our plasmoid medium. This is both a mechanical drive and an electron scavenger. The individual frequencies are a consequence of the magnet's fixed rate of progression over an expanding distance. The electromagnetic pulsing through the coils, with a differentially expanding spacing determined by phi on our plasmoid pi surface between the coil's elemental locations, generates all the elemental frequencies and therefore combine to produce none again the 360 degree zero degree paradigm. The zero point monopolar collision created by our implosive vortex waveguide causes opposite spirals to collide in quadrature and in sequence therefore maintaining a large zero point center and 16 peripheral zero points at the implosive vortex waveguides equatorial plane. This enables the zero matter plane to be tapped and therefore harnessed as an energy source. The purpose of the scavenger unit is to facilitate a closed feedback loop by harvesting the free electrons and recirculating both the DC and AC charge, this sustains the discharge in quadrature required by the implosive vortex waveguide turbine, enabling the engine's operation in both submarine and space environments.